Welcome back. Today we are wrapping up our look at World War II. So let's get started. By this point, the war was definitely switching emphasis on well, who's winning. The Germans had been dominating the first half of the war, but the second half was definitely the Allied forces. After the Americans are able to take control of Northern Africa, they move on to Italy. And the Italian campaign was decisive. It was hard fought. The Italians definitely needed the help of the Germans to help maintain as long as they could, but the people no longer were willing to support the fascist government, to support Mussolini. And when the Italian forces, the Italian army was forced to surrender, Mussolini himself was arrested, put under house arrest. It looked like he was going to stand trial until Hitler's guys tried to free him, but once that happened, the people just killed Mussolini and a couple of his head guys and even his mistress who just happened to be in the room when it all went down. Italy was still fighting uh, for a while, even with Mussolini gone, the soldiers were still willing to keep fighting, not as much. And it was more fighting like in the mountains, so it's not as... It's more difficult terrain than it is difficult forces. Prior to the end of the war, we see the first peace treaty, as we might even call it, was arranged of what are we going to do after the war. And this was actually a good idea to do it like this. In World War I, the Treaty of Versailles ended and everyone was like, okay, that's it, the war is over but there were still a lot of hurt feelings and people upset with what had taken place. And ultimately the failings of Versailles led to World War II. The question was, what are we gonna do with Germany? Everyone agreed it needed to be split up following the war. Uh, Stalin said that he deserved the largest part because he had been fighting the Germans on the ground longer than the other two and he had lost so many more people to the germans than the other two um roosevelt said that it should continue to exist just much weaker and churchill said that it needed to exist and kind of act as a counterbalance to the might of the soviet union Stalin says that when the fighting with the Nazis is over, he is going to help fight the Japanese. And all three of them agree that a United Nations will help make sure this doesn't happen again. A lot like Wilson's League of Nations, only this one's going to actually work. The goal of opening up another front against the Germans would be the work of the Supreme Allied Commander of US forces, General Eisenhower. This would become D-Day, Operation Overlord, as it was known as, the land invasion of Northern France. The decision was to invade Normandy, June 6, 1944, and we're gonna open up five beaches at once using these Higgins landing crafts. This was the largest amphibious assault that we had ever seen. It included airdrops. It included artillery blasts from warship. It included um, when it, we were gonna go based on what the lunar cycle was. So we knew what the tides were gonna be like. And it was hard fought casualties were very bad in some places it was 50 percent and the expectations were one out of every four people perhaps but we were able to open that other front up in fighting the japanese the tactics were divided up and worked by admiral chester nimitz and the tactic here is called island hopping, where you go from one small island group to the next, to the next. And while you're doing this, you are 
cutting the Japanese Empire off from the other islands that can't support it. So you're both weakening the empire militarily as well as resource-wise. General Douglas MacArthur, the governor of the Philippines who had left in 43, reads turns to retake the Philippines and actually leads the uh, forces that will retake it. The fighting is pretty intense. This was the first time that we see the use of the kamikaze plane pilots. The Japanese were no longer had the resources to put giant offensives forces together. But they did still have a lot of the resources. The concept of suicide in Japan does not have the same negative constructs as it has in the West. And it's it was seen as an acceptable use of your life to hurt your enemy and kill your enemy as much as possible. Allied forces that landed in France were able to take France within three months and by December we were at the border with Germany. This was the last major offensive force that the Germans throw at us, the Battle of the Bulge, and it is where the Germans basically threw everything they could at the American forces hoping to break through, retake North France, kick us off the continent. It was a good attempt, but it had, and it was very fiercely fought, but it did not last at all. This was the largest battle fought by the American forces in Europe. The Nazi forces fall on April of 1945. And well, in, in April of 1945, FDR dies. Uh, two weeks after FDR dies of um, complications to polio, we see that Hitler commits suicide. By May 8th, it is an unconditional victory. The Germans have surrendered. This picture here is the Soviet army raising the communist flag over the Reichstag, a German parliament. And this map kind of depicts the last major advancements that happened and some of the biggest advancements that happened. Remember, the war was go had been going on for several years at this point. The island hopping tactic was continuing to work in the Pacific. The taking of Iwo Jima was significant because with Iwo taken, we could launch bombers right off the island instead of aircraft carriers to hit mainland Japan. And fighting of Iwo was surprisingly high. We knew it was going to be, we assumed it was going to be bad because of its tactical um, significance and location. But the Japanese hid in tunnel systems that were created under the island. So when Americans arrived, we didn't even think there was anyone there. And then, you know, surprise, and it, it gets bad. We were fortunately able to take the island. And the what follows is the firebombing of Japan. And we used firebombs because the large parts of Japan were built using wood, built using bamboo, and napalm and firebombing could spread the fires faster. And it was hoped to demoralize the Japanese into surrendering. But we hadn't seen large numbers of Japanese surrender. We had seen kamikaze pilots. We had seen bonsai attacks where uh, Japanese soldiers by the hundreds would just take grenades, pull the pins, and run towards the American front line and, and, and die with it. It just, it, 
was not going to work the surrender like that. We needed something else. Okinawa was the southernmost of the home islands, and its fall was one of those, hooray, we're within home stretch. But this one island cost the lives of 12,000 Americans. Japan's idea of surrender was, um, it wasn't going to happen, no matter what. Um, the emperor was in power. The government was not willing to step down. The military was not going to give up. It's not going to happen. Years earlier, in 1941, Einstein had written a letter to the president, President FDR, and told him that the Germans are working on atomic weapons. And at this point, the idea of an atomic weapon was theoretical i mean we are it's more theoretical than a laser would be as a weapon system today and we start building and researching the, the possibility of atomic weapons for fear that the germans were going to do this with germany gone the use of the weapon now meant something different. Germany falls in May. In June, we have tested successfully an atomic weapon, and we have, an, we have atomic weapons. The question is, should we use this thing to end the war? And all the math said that if we wanted to land an army in Japan and have that army take Japan, considering that the Japanese had not surrendered and as bad as casualties had been just getting to Japan, it's going to cost the lives of probably a million Americans. Or you can drop one bomb and potentially end the war in a day. There were two different models for two different types of weapons. Uh, the Fat Man is the plutonium-based implosion bomb, and Little Boy is the uranium-based gun-type model. They operate different ways because we didn't know which way would actually work. Uh, turns out they both do. These are some modern ideas of smaller atomic weapons. Uh, with the decision to use them, we dropped the first bomb on August 6, 1945 on Hiroshima, and 40,000 people died. We gave the Japanese a chance to surrender beforehand. We told them we have a weapon that does horrible damage, and we will use it against you. If you surrender, we won't. And they chose not to, so we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Um, the next day, we told them the same thing. We have another one of those weapons. We'll, we'll do it again unless you surrender. They, again, chose not to. So on August 9th, we dropped another bomb. And a week later, Japan surrendered. The devastation of atomic weapons the world had never seen before. This used to be Hiroshima. The Loss of life here was just catastrophic. 40,000 people dead in a second. Hundreds of thousands dead from radiation burns and the more and more cancer burns that we see later on take our death tolls to the six figures. Following the war, there's a couple things that happened very quickly. The first is the creation of the United Nations, a multinational peacekeeping entity whose goal was to make sure that large international conflict never happened again. The Security Council was made up of the five most powerful nations at the time who would have the ability to deploy forces, deploy influence, and enact embargoes on nations to make sure that stuff happened certain ways. 
The military tribunals that took place included the trials of the Nazis at Nuremberg. They were committed against crimes against the of humanity and high-ranking Nazi officials, high-ranking German officials who said, hey, I was only following orders. They usually were, well, they did not last. Um, the These guys were all executed death by hanging by the Hague. The trials that were conducted against the Japanese included um, one component from the Japanese term of surrender was that the emperor would be allowed to maintain power. And we that was, okay, that's fine, but we, the prime minister was not. Um, Yamamoto was taken and executed. The last prisoner of the Nazi regime was this man, Rudolf Hess. Hess was close to Hitler and in 1941, on his own, went to England. He flew to Scotland and then, then goes into England with the a hope that he could convince the British to surrender. Um, now, mind you, he was very quickly, hey, look, there's a German plane. Hey, look, there's a guy with a Nazi uniform. So he was arrested very quickly. His message goes to the British government and the British government says, we will never surrender to the Germans. It's never going to happen. And he was put in prison. When the war was over, um, Hess was sentenced to life in prison at Spandu, at Spandu and he was held there as a prisoner until he hung himself in 87. He was the only prisoner of that facility from 1966 until his uh, suicide in 87. The last Japanese soldiers were um, Hiro Onada and a, a small group of others who had been in the Philippines, been in the field, and when the war ended and the call to lay down your arms went out, he thought, oh, this is just a trick. This is just, there's, there's no way the empire is really gone. And he chose to await further orders, and those further orders never came. So he and a group of other soldiers uh, survived on stuff they stole and stuff they gathered, expecting here comes here comes the good the, our empire is still out there reinforcements are going to show up and it wasn't until 1974 did um was he and his guys routed and convinced by a former commanding officer yeah the war really did end so these guys were in self-isolated mentality of the war still going on three decades after it ended World War II had a huge impact on the world. It transformed the United States into the superpower and is going to lay the foundations for the Cold War. But that's a story for another time. Hope you learned something today. I'll see you next time.